Hey there, everyone. I'm excited to introduce a new project that we've been working on that takes uh, a new project to improve usability of TensorFlow. And we care so much about usability here that we're going all the way back to first principles of the computation that we're performing. But first, why usability? I hope that everyone here agrees that, that productivity and machine learning is critical because it leads to a faster pace of innovation and progress in our field. And of course, we just want to build beautiful things for TensorFlow users, and so that's a big piece of it as well. But if you look at machine learning frameworks, there's two major approaches. The most familiar are the graph building approaches, where you explicitly define a graph and then execute it to run your computation. This is great for performance, but isn't always the best for usability. In contrast, the defined by run approaches like eager execution aren't always the best for performance, but they, get, they allow you to use language control flow and other things that make them a lot easier to use. The interesting thing about both of these approaches is that they're really about allowing Python to understand the difference between the tensor computation in your code and all the other non-tensor stuff like command line option processing and visualization and the other things that you do. And so I think it's interesting to look at how these actually work. In the case of eager execution, for example, you write your model, and Python starts out by parsing it. And then it feeds every statement at a time to the interpreter. And if it's a tensor operation, it fires up TensorFlow and hands it off, and TensorFlow takes care of your tensor operations. Otherwise, the Python interpreter runs it. Now, the key thing about eager execution and graph building is that they're designed within the constraints of what you can do as a Python library. Now, if you crack open the compiler and look at it from what could we do with the compiler and language involved, there's a whole other set of approaches that can be applied to solving this particular problem. And that's what we're doing. The cool thing about a compiler is that after you parse your code, the compiler can see the entire program and all the tensor ops in it. And so what we're doing is we're going to add a new stage to the compiler that automatically takes these tensor operations out of your program, builds a standard TensorFlow graph for you, and then hands it to TensorFlow. And because it's a standard TensorFlow graph, you get full access to all the things that TensorFlow can do, including all the devices. Now, we think that this approach is a really great combination because you get all the power and flexibility of TensorFlow, but you also get the usability of eager execution as well. But there's a catch. There's always a catch, right? The catch here is that we can't do this with Python, at least not with the reliability we expect, because it doesn't support the kind of compiler analysis we need. And what do we mean by that? Well, the compiler has to be able to reason about values as they flow through your program, has to reason about control flow and function calls, has to reason about variable aliasing and other things like that. And if we can't directly use Python, then as users, of course, we care a lot about all the nice things we've come to love about Python, including the ability to use all the standard Python APIs. So I know what you're thinking. Does this mean that we're talking about doing a new language? Well, that's definitely an approach to solve the technical requirements we want. And if we do a new language, we can obviously build all the nice things we want into it. But this comes at a cost, because it turns out that we'd be foregoing the benefits of having a community. And that includes things like tools and libraries, but also things like books, which some people still use. Um, and even more significantly, this would take years of time to get right. And machine learning just moves too fast. No, we think it's better to use an existing language. But here we have to be careful, because to do this right, we have to make significant improvements to the compiler and the language, and we need to be able to do this in a reasonable amount of time. And so, of course, this brings us to the Swift programming language. Now, I assume that most of you are not very familiar with Swift, so I'll give you a quick introduction. Swift is designed with a lightweight syntax, and it's really geared towards being easy to, to use and learn. Swift draws together best practices from lots of different places, including things like functional programming and generics. Swift builds on LLVM, which means that, of course, it has an interpreter, and it has um, scripting capabilities as well. Swift is great in notebook environments, and these are really awesome when you're interactively developing in real time. Swift is also open source. It's portable to lots of platforms, and it has a big community of people. But the number one thing that's most important to us is it has an open, fully open design environment called Swift Evolution, which allows us to propose first-class machine learning language and compiler features directly for integration into Swift. And if you bring all of this together that we've been talking about here, I'm happy to introduce Swift for TensorFlow. 
Swift for TensorFlow gives you the full performance of graphs. You can use native language control flow, has built-in support for automatic differentiation. It can detect errors in your code without even running it, and has full access to Python APIs. But instead of telling you about it, I'd like to invite up Richard Way to show it to you now. Thank you, Chris. I'm thrilled to show you Swift for TensorFlow. Swift is a high-performance modern programming language. And today, for the very first time, Swift has a full-power TensorFlow built right in. I'm going to walk through three major styles of programming, um, scripting, interpreting, and notebooks. So first, let me show you the Swift interpreter. This is a Swift interpreter. When I type some code, Swift evaluates it and prints the result, just like Python. Now let's import TensorFlow. I can create a tensor from some scalars. Now I can do any TensorFlow operation directly and see the result just like I would with eager execution. For example, A plus A, or ACE matrix product with itself. Of course, loops just work. I can print the result of A. Now, interpreters are a lot of fun to work with. But I like using TensorFlow in a more interactive environment, just like Jupyter Notebook. So let's see how they work. This is a Swift notebook. It shows all the results on the right. So here's some more interesting code. Fun with functions. So here I have a sigmoid function inside a loop. Now, as I click on this button, it shows that a trace of all values produced by this function over time. Now, as a machine learning developer, I often like to differentiate functions. Now, when I type in, well, since we were able to uh, improve the programming language, we built first-class automatic differentiation right into Swift. Now, when I type in gradient of x, it shows the gradient. Swift computes the gradient automatically and gives me the result. So here's the gradient of sigmoid. Now, let's look at some Python code. Let's think about Python. Well, as a machine learning developer, I've been using Python a lot. And I know there are many great Python libraries. Just today, my colleague Dan sent me a data set in pickle format. Well, I can directly use Python APIs to load it. All I have to do is just type in import Python. And Swift uses the Python API, Pickle, to be, to be specific, to load the data. And here, you can see the data right in the Swift notebook. Now, so here's the Swift notebook. Now, some people like to run training scripts directly in command line. So let me show you how to train a simple model from in command line. So here, here is a simple MNIST model. In this model, I'm using TensorFlow's dataset API to load training data. As I scroll down, I have the forward pass, backward pass, gradient descent, all defined in the training loop. Now, I usually like to work on the go, so this code uh, has been working on the CPU on my laptop. But when I want to get more performance, what do I do? Well, why don't I just enable Cloud TPU? So all I have to do is add one line to enable TPU execution. When I save this file, open the terminal to run this training script. It's initializing TPU, 
and the Swift compiler automatically partitions this program into a normal Swift program and a TensorFlow graph. And TensorFlow is sending this graph to the TensorFlow SLA compiler for TPU execution. Now it's running, and we're waiting for the TPU to give the result. Look, the loss is going down. All right. So why don't we simply open TensorBoard and see the training curve? So now I can see the entire training history in TensorBoard. So this is looking great. Now, this is Swift for TensorFlow. It's an interactive programming experience with supercomputing performance at your fingertips. Back to you, Chris. Richard. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> All right, to recap quickly, Richard showed you that Swift has an interpreter, and it works just like you'd expect. Now, I know that it's super frustrating to be working on a, a program, and two hours into a training run, you get a shape error or a type mismatch. Swift is designed to catch errors early, and we've started building in support for catching TensorFlow-specific mistakes right into TensorFlow. We showed that it's, you can directly use arbitrary Python APIs and other dynamic languages directly from Swift, which gives you full access to the data science ecosystem and any other Python APIs that you just love to use. Swift is also generating standard TensorFlow graphs, including control flow, which give you the full performance of the session API. And of course, graphs are also awesome because they give you access to everything that TensorFlow can do, including devices spanning the range from the tiniest Raspberry Pi all the way up to a TPU supercomputer. Now, you may be wondering, when do you get this? What does this mean? Well, this is still an early stage project, but I'm happy to say that we're looking forward to our open source release next month. And not only are we releasing the code, we're releasing technical white papers and documents to explain how it works. And we're also moving our design discussions out in the public onto a Google group so that everybody who wants to can participate. Now, we're not done yet. So we have basic support for automatic differentiation built right into the compiler and the language. But we're also really interested in extending it to support exotic cases like recursion and even differentiating custom data structures. Compatibility issues are also super frustrating, particularly if you accidentally use an op or a d-type that's not supported by your device. Swift has great support for detecting availability issues like this, and we're looking forward to wiring this right into support TensorFlow. We're also interested in high-level APIs, but with this, we want to be a little bit cautious. We have some prototypes now, but we'd really like to work with the community and evaluate and iterate and design multiple different approaches and actually experiment with these and then settle on the best one based on real-world experience. Now, this has been a super quick tour of Swift for TensorFlow. Swift for TensorFlow combines the power and flexibility of TensorFlow with a whole new standard for usability. We think it's going to take your productivity and shoot it to the roof. Um, Swift for TensorFlow is also an early stage project, and so we'd really love for you to get interested and help us to build this future. Thank you. <laughs>